very clear that COVID-19 is setting the stage for Revelation 13. Zoo family, Zoo family. Uh, this is why it was important for us to understand who the beast was, as we now have moved into contemporary, contemporary uh, messages. Uh, as we see, we're uh, leading into, uh, I just would like to read very clearly and very slowly so you understand where we are, so you can see the big picture, big picture. Just stay with me today. I'm going to take our time because I want you to get it because the time is at hand. We're not going to be able to preach these messages uh, very soon. And so don't get too concerned today about time. We're not gonna be able to preach these messages very soon. And so the time is at hand. And so I wanna take my time here. And so Revelation 13, one to 18, I'm gonna read it all and follow with me, follow with me. It says, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns and upon his horns, 10 crowns and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. All right, that's what we looked at the first part. The world events, we see, but you look at here. There's a war, the dragon gave this first beast, as we saw, his power, his seat, and great authority. It's important that you see that. And I saw one of his heads as it was wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And so we begin to see by worshiping the beast, you're actually worshiping Satan. All right, there's a war going on, fam. there's a war. There's a war going on. But, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy. This kingdom blasphemy is against God. To blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And we saw this during the dark ages with this, uh, this type of system, this, this kingdom. It says, and all the world, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Hold on. All the world that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, slain from the foundation of the world. So the only people that do not worship the beast is those na whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I want to be my, make sure my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm not going to follow by the grace of God. I will not worship this beast. But it says, if any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is patience and the faith of the saints. That was one. And then it says, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. We looked at this last week, the United States of America, his kingdom. So his angel speaks through his laws. That's what we're going to talk about next week. And he exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. The United States of America is going to cause the world to worship the Roman Catholic, the papacy, this is the scene. This is what Revelation, as we've learned who these beasts are. This is important that we understand. <laughs> We're going to show how it's actually happening next week, especially. And so how, how, how the devil is going to make it happen. And so we clearly see, 13, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth and in the sight of man. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And that's our message, the image of the beast. Next week, don't want to miss it. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, and the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small, great, rich, poor, free, slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, 
that no one may buy or sell except one has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. All right. Are you all ready? Family, clearly, there is a war going on. The invisible enemy is not COVID-19, even though COVID-19 is helping to set the stage up for Revelation 13. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Convicted, convinced, evil is doing this. Dwight Nelson has been saying all week in the program that we've been part of, he says, can we get there from here? <laughs> Family, the stage has been set and the final movements are rapid ones. You all know we've been preaching this message for a long time. I'm 12 years in ministry. I've been preaching it since I came into full-time ministry. And I can tell you, when I used to talk about things happening, it, it was things based off of things happening. You know, sometimes I'll see, pick up things happening six to 12 months. I mean, I cannot even keep up to date with what's happening. There's so much happening that is pushing this scene towards Revelation 13. I cannot uh, keep up. The final movements are truly rapid ones. The dragon knows that his time is short. And we need to be prepared for this last conflict and have on the whole armor of God. As I always say, this is a cruise, this is not a cruise ship. We're on a battleship and our eternal destiny is at stake so that we understand the times so that we know what to do during those times. That was the, the tribe of Issachar. They understood the times and knew exactly what it is the people of God need to do during this time. And this is why these messages are important. These are the messages that need to be preached today. And so some people don't even know that there's a war going on. And many are going to be caught off guard. But God in his great love and mercy wants us to know Recognize, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood family, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual, spiritual wickedness in high place. There is an invisible enemy. I worry that COVID-19 is nothing. This is just setting the stage for them to work, the evil to work. So it's a war, family. And we, know we know this is a war. Because as a matter of fact, we saw in Revelation 12, 17. We've been looking at this text for a while. It says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman. We know what? A dragon was represents Satan. We know who it is. We see it through symbolism and signs in Revelation and Daniel. He was wroth. He was angry with the woman. What's a woman in Bible prophecy? The church. God's church. Anybody that believes in Jesus Christ. But he went to make war. This is why this message is important today. So that you understand. So that you know how to prepare your family and yourself. And have this intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Because he has, is about to make war with the remnant of her seed, and it identifies, Revelation identifies the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, all 10, by the way, all 10 commandments. Yes, all 10. And have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 19, you know, Revelation 19 10 says the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. I tell you all the time. Thing with this, we knew exactly what's going to happen. We knew, we knew his next move. We should know this. God raised the church for this a movement for this very time. And it's at war with this group because they tell things to come and they have the commandments of God. They keep the commandments of God. John 16, 13 says, How be it when the spirit, the truth is come? He says, He will guide you into all truth and it will tell you things to come. Jesus says that those who worship me will worship in spirit and in truth. And so one of your questions that we had, does it matter how we worship? Well, let's go back to the beginning and let's see if it matters how we worship. Because the issue at the end of time, as you was highlighted, is an issue of worship. It's an issue of worship. How we worship, who we worship. Does it matter? Well, well let's look at the story of uh, Cain and Abel in the beginning. And Genesis 4, 3, it lets us know to 5, it says, And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And it says, And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of the flock and of the, of the fat thereof. And the Lord, and the Lord had respected unto Abel and his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had no respect. But they were both worshiping. And Cain was very, here we go, there's that word, wroth or angry, and his countenance fell. All right, family, here you have the first scene. 
that will be the last scene. History repeats itself. God says there's nothing new under the sun. So it was at the beginning, so it will be at the end. The issue will be an issue, a religious issue, a worship issue. These brothers were tested as Adam had been tested before to prove whether they would believe and obey the word of God. They were acquainted with the provision made for the salvation of man and understood the system of offerings which God had ordained. They knew that in these offerings, they were to express faith in the Savior whom the offerings typified, typified and, and at the same time to acknowledge their total dependence on him for pardon. And they knew, they knew that by conforming to the divine plan of redemption, they were giving proof of their obedience to the will of God. Because the word of God is very clear. Without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sin. And they were to show their, their faith in the blood of Jesus Christ as the promised atonement by offering the, the first flock in sacrifice. The first. So, so this was supposed to happen. They, they were supposed to bring a lamb. <laughs> Abel brought a lamb. Abel worshipped how God wanted him to worship, but, but Cain, gave, Cain gave God the best of his fruit. Cain gave God his best, but it was not what God asked for. The two brothers erected their altars alike. They brought an offering. Abel presented a sacrifice from the flock in accordance with the directions, the instructions. And the Lord had respected Abel's. That's what it says, right? Look at the text. He respected Abel's. You can imagine fire, flesh from heaven, consumed the sacrifice. But Cain, disregarding the Lord's direct and explicit command, presented off only an offering of fruit. There was no token for heaven to show that he was accepted. Imagine Abel pleaded with his brother to approach God in the divinely prescribed way, but Cain determined to go about doing his own will. I'm going to worship God how I want to worship God. This is my tradition. The rest is history, family. Brother turned on brother. Let me say it again. Brother turned on brother. Cain persecuted, killed Abel. It was because of worship. It was because of worship. From the beginning, it's about worship. Here, here is proof to answer your question. It does matter how we worship, who we worship. Because obedience is a sign of true faith. I don't obey to be saved. I obey because by faith I am saved. And love causes me to obey. This obedience brings consequences. But it's not the consequences that motivates me to obey. I obey because of the Son, and thank you, Jesus, for providing a way of escape. This is important to understand as we set the scene, because you want to know, what is the mark of the beast? Because this is God's great and final warning to the world, family. It is a message of faith and obedience. God has called our people to proclaim this message during this time. Yes, even in 2020. I am sure of it. We'll go into even more theological detail in the fall. We're going to do a series that we've planned. We were planning uh, on September 19th that we were going to start on the third angel's message. Third angel's message. We've talked about the first and the second angel, but the third angel's message. Because the devil knows that his time is short. We know, we know the, the uh, three angels' messages. You know, and the three angels' message, Revelation 14, it comes up. Uh, 6 to 12, and he saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, heaven the everlasting gospel, to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Yes, judgment is come. And worship, worship, worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Then there's another message, a second angel says, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the, of, of the wrath of a fornication. And we've talked about those messages in the past. But family, family, there's a third angel. Look what it says. This is important. That's what, we're just we're trying to say, look what it says. It says, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, this is the message that the movement is supposed to be preaching during this time about Christ, our righteousness. It says, if any man worship, because the issue of worship is about Christ's righteousness. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, 
the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. See, they, these are the seven last plagues. That's the seven last plagues. But it clearly reveals that, that you don't receive the seven last plagues until you've made a decision in reference to receiving the mark of the beast. See, the only individuals that are going to receive the seven last plagues are those who take the mark of the beast. That's what the text is saying. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of the torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast. Worship. There we go. It's very clear. This issue is worship. Worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is patience of the saints. Are you saying? Here are they that keep. Oh, here we go again. Look, here you go. Here are they that is that those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You're going to need patience during this time to believe in God, to, to continue to hold fast at his word, to keep the commandments, all 10 commandments, and the faith of Jesus. You see, there's a difference of having faith in Jesus is different than having faith of Jesus. Faith in Jesus, I believe and say, but faith of Jesus, this is more application. You, you have to bear a cross that you must go through by faith, but it's the faith of Jesus. It's Christ in me. Because I know I'm going to need Christ in me to go through this time. So that's why we desperately need God's Holy Spirit. So family, because the reality is God loves us. He has given us this message of warning. I'm spending time here because what we're about to go into is, is going to be new to all and, 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 and may, may cause a little bit of ruckus. It, it may, may make you uncomfortable. What is God's truth for this time? Wouldn't you want to be part of that group that left Jerusalem in 1870 when they got the warning that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed? And the people who listened, they left Jerusalem. And because they left Jerusalem, they were safe and saved. You see, you can kill my body, but you can't take my soul. And so the reality is God loves us. And his message, this message is a warning of love because the enemy is doing this. The enemy is trying to, to, trying to unsave those who are saved and keep those who are lost to be lost. But God has made a provision of a way of escape and has given us his truth. And you know, the word for God so loved the word that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He wants us to be saved if you believe in him and his word. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but through the world might be saved through him. He loves us. That's our demons of him this year. Message of love. This is a message of love, a warning. He that believeth in him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So God does not want anybody to perish. And so he's giving this message of warning to his servants. The thing this much take you, sport take you place. As he says, blessed is those who hear so consider yourself blessed that you're hearing this message. Blessed are those who, who hear, blessed are those who read, if you're reading, and blessed are those who do the things in this book. Consider yourself blessed. So this is an application message. And so this is very, very, very important because in Revelation 16, 1 to 2, the word of God lets us know, this is, this is, this is the scene we're talking about. Revelation 16 speaks to what the last seven plagues are. See, COVID-19 is not one of the seven last plagues that many are thinking of. The mark of the beast, Christ is recorded in Revelation 13, will bring about the seven last plagues, as you will begin to see. But this is what it says. It said, then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, because there, there are angels holding back the winds of strife. There's certain things happening now. He says, go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. And so what's happening because men have rejected God, the inevitable now is happening because you rejected God. God now you say, you don't want God. You, you're, you're taking his mark now. So you literally have made a decision because of law. You've di literally disregarded God. He says, so the first went and poured out his bill upon the earth and a foul and a loathsome and, and sore came upon the man who had the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. Today we're going to talk about the mark of the beast. Next week, there's his image. You see, family, this is important. This is a very important message. Don't you want to know what the mark of the beast is? Isn't it important? It is important to know what the mark of the beast is. Why? Because many who think they will not take the mark of the beast will end up accepting the mark of the beast because they don't know the truth. And this is so important right now. By worshiping the beast, we saw it. We're worshiping Satan. Worship is an issue. Deception is the name of the game today. The beast, we had to find out who the beast was in order to understand what the mark of the beast was. And just what Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth shall make you free. I'm so glad I know this truth in Jesus. The book, the book of Revelation warns us of receiving his mark. And so we identified the, 
the second beast or the first beast of Revelation. And we know because of our Bible study, we know as you see in the, that picture there, uh, this in Texas will not take the mark of the beast. We know it ain't the vaccine or the chip or ID20. And so what is the mark of the beast? You must know first who the beast is. And that's why we spend so much time understanding who these beasts are. And so we clearly see the mark, the beast is the Roman Catholic Church, isn't the papacy, the papacy. So the question is, the question is, and this is what I want you to zoom in, what is the mark of the beast then? What is the mark of papacy? What is, the, what is the, their mark of authority? Now to understand it, we, we, this is why we have to deal, you know, identify clearly the, the, who the beast was, which by the way, because prophecy of no private interpretation, we saw that even the early Protestants, they knew who this ethnic Christ system was, but something has happened, especially in the last 20 years. Something as strange has happened. And so it's like, oh, the world doesn't even know what's going on. And, 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 and so, and they don't even know this. So last week, with this, we'll talk about Jesuits next week. I'm not gonna say anything about it right now, but, look, but just look what's happening. So many people are confused today. They're confused because, you know, before we, before we reveal the mark of the beast is, uh, before we, we go there, let's deal with quick with the easy uh, part of this beast. In Revelation 13, 18, it says, here is wisdom. That him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and six, or 666. So, so that's, that's, that's how it ended. It was letting us know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it says, here's wisdom, you know, understanding, count the number of the beast. For it is a number of a man. And so, you know, I, I know there's so much going on in reference to, you know, Bill Gates. And, and no way do I trust Bill Gates. I'm sorry. But, but clearly, uh, you can see there's some strange things going on. He, he has his Microsoft patent. This is for his body interface digital currency. It says 060606. <laughs> so, so everybody's getting caught up. That's the mark of the beast. Well, hold on. Bill Gates is not the beast. So it can't be Bill Gates. He's not the beast. We know who the beast is. So I don't care if it's got all this digital stuff going on, this technology, and it's not even a science, but says so much in reference to these vaccines. Oh, that's gonna be a hard time right there. But, but we can clearly see that, that there, there is a pandemic. Yeah, there, there is a pandemic. But what I know because of the Bible, this is why we must be people of the book, because of the Bible, because all I see this is being a smoke screen. The devil was very crafty, and, and, and he, he, knows, he knows how to work this thing. And so he's taking people's attention of, of what's really going on during this time. So it says, count the number of the beast. Bill Gates is not the beast. Nor is the microchip, nor is the vaccine. Both I don't like, but I know what it's going to lead to. Well, well people are thinking... That is the mark of the beast. They're not realizing what it really is. And so we have to go to the beast, the Roman Catholic Church, to get the answer of what the mark of authority, their mark is. And the Latin is the official language of the Catholic Church. And, and so even when we look at the name, because we're talking about the name, the, the, is, is, is the, it says the number of the man, the number of the man. You have, so here's the number of the man. We understand. This is their own writings that I'm revealing to you right now. This is from the Roman Catholic Church writings themselves, right here. Catholics hold that the church, which is a visible society, must have a visible head. So that's their writings. This is our Sunday visitor. All right, you see that. That's, that's not me. That's not me crafting. That's their writings. Go ahead. You can search it. Google it. Do whatever you find the right source to reference, because I'll reference so you can search for yourselves. This is them. They said the Catholic Church holds the church. The Catholic holds that the church, which is a visible society, must have a visible head. Catholic means universal. All right. And so clearly this is why you have to understand the Pope. And so you see there the Pope on his throne between two cherubims. That reminds me of something in scripture. I wonder who stands between two cherubims in heaven. Says, well, hey, it's like a contrivit going on. But here we go. So this is the man. So we have to identify then it has something to do with this man. And so, so the official title, family, the official title of the Pope in Latin, the language of the Popes and Rome is Vicarius Philae Dei, or substitute for the Son of God. The numerical value of the name, uh, the man's name, the title, it leads to family. It's very clear. This is not <laughs> new knowledge. This is, this is always new. They don't, they don't wear the crowns as much because it was just so easy. To, but this is the official, this is the official title of, 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 of the, uh, of, of the uh, Pope. Uh, the, the papacy's title is the Vicarius Philae Dei. You will see 
uh, that the numerical value in Latin letters are easy to calculate. Vicarious is 112, Philae 53, day 501, making the total 666. And in the broader sense of, of vicar, so you understand what vicar in the Latin trans is, it means representative or deputy or substitute, any, anyone acting in the person of or agent for a superior. That's what vicar, vic, vic, vicar is. In the sense, the title is comparable to uh, literally saying a placeholder. And so what they're saying, Pope is a representative or one who stands in place of Christ. That's what anti means, the antichrist, to stand in place of. Satan wanted to stand even in the place of God. I will set my throne above the most high. That's what he did. So it's a counterfeit. But you can see out of the mouth of the popes themselves, it says the Pope, this is what uh, St. Pope Pius X says. He says the Pope is not only, is not simply, sorry, the representative of Jesus Christ. On the contrary, he is Jesus Christ himself under the veil of the flesh, and who by means of a being commonly to human continues his ministry amongst men. Does the Pope speak? It is Jesus Christ who is speaking. There you go for yourself. That's it, family. This is very clear. This is their, their, their writings. Even, even in our Sunday visitor uh, here, it, it says the letters on the Pope's crown are these. This is, what, this is their writings, Vicarius Philae Dei, which is Latin for Vicar of the Son of God. There you go. So that's, that's the man, that's, that's the man. So, so easy, because we already understand who the BC is, but that's, so you understand the, the number of the man, the number of the representative. But, but the question you wanna ask, what is the mark of the beast? What is, what is the mark of the beast that, that is gonna cause all both small, great, rich and poor, free and bound to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads that no man may buy or sell unless they have the mark of the beast or the number of his name. And so we clearly see that this is why we had to understand who, what the beast was, who the beast was to understand what his mark is. That's what I want to do, family, because I usually do this when I do series. I usually talk about the mark of God before I talk about the mark of the beast, but I don't have time to do it today. But however, however, if you look at the scriptures, you look at the scriptures, I'm going to just give you a quick, quick study on it. But what I want you to do is uh, between now and next week, I want you to check out this message uh, that was preached uh, just a couple of weeks ago uh, by myself that will help you to understand even this issue in reference to God's mark. And so it's, it's a message called How to Keep the Sabbath. Uh, you could go on to the YouTube channel here. You can take a, uh, you know, take a screenshot, you can go here, or you can Google in on YouTube, How to Keep the Sabbath, Pastor Dijon Tal. Uh, you can go to these sites, the conference site, the web website, or you can just send me a WhatsApp and I can send it directly to you. My number is 704-0510. Send me a WhatsApp and I'll get that WhatsApp and I'll send it straight off to you, that, that's very message. But I want you to get this because it's important that we understand the issue of the Sabbath. It's not just about a day, it's what the day actually represents. And, and that's why you're gonna see the importance to Today. Because when we look at the mark of God and, and the mark of the beast, because when you look at Genesis 2, and as a matter of fact, I want my wife to remind me, I really want you to, to get it. So I'm going to take a poll next week, and I'm just going to ask a question. How many of you all uh, watched uh, How to Keep the Sabbath? If you watched it before, because it's been on before, then that's fine. Um, you can put yes. But, but for those who have not watched it, I'm encouraging you to watch it so you understand the real truth of God's Sabbath. So you, so you understand how we get it in your mind, because some people are keeping the right day, but they're keeping it for the wrong reason. And so it's important that you understand the Sabbath. And, and so, and so I, I want to say everyone to, 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 uh, to watch and take this opportunity. But look at Genesis 2, 1, 2, 3 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which he had created. And so you clearly see that, that God sanctified and blessed the seventh day. He made it holy. He, he sanctified. That's what sanctifying means. And so God, before there was a Jew, there was the Sabbath. So the Lord's day is not, it is not any other day, but the Sabbath. You know, it's not, the Sabbath wasn't made for Jews. There was no Jews. The Sabbath was made for mankind. He already has a day of rest. And so, so this is very important that you understand, that we understand, so we can understand the Sabbath and what it actually re really means. Because even when you look at Exodus 31, 12 to 13 and 17, look what he says. God says, this is even after he gave them the Ten Commandments so that they understand because they have been so far removed because they were in slavery for, for 400 years. And he says, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speak thou also to the children of Israel, saying, very, verily, my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign or mark between me and you 
throughout your generations. You want to know what's a sign between God and, this, and, and throughout his generations? Throughout all his generations, because we are spiritual Israel today, that ye may know that I am the Lord that sanctifies you, that I am the God that's going to make you holy. And so this is a sign. The Sabbath is a sign that is God that's going to make you holy. He who begun a good work in you will complete it. The Sabbath is me. You may feel undone right now, but the Sabbath is a reminder that God will complete a work in you. Don't give up, family. Jesus has a work to do in you. And the Sabbath is a reminder that he will make you holy. Oh, come on now. This is the gospel. And, and so it's a sign that, that you are God's and, and he will make you holy. He will complete the work. You just stand for it by faith. And so it is a sign, it says, between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. It's also a reminder that he is our creator. And so it's very interesting because there were two things that God blessed uh, at the beginning of time, and that was marriage and the Sabbath. And it's very interesting that a war is going on. First, the war was on marriage. We talk this at Hampton Church in February in our Love is Love series. The first is marriage, and then the other one is the Sabbath. Someone calls them twin institutions. As a matter of fact, someone also says, as one goes, the other one is right behind it. The final movements will be rapid ones. So these are two things God blessed was marriage and the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a sign, is, is, the, is God's mark that he is God and created you and declared you to be who. And, and so now that you understand that, now that you understand that, and please, please go to the message that, that, I, that I am asking you to go to. Please, if you don't know where it is, you know, WhatsApp me uh, or whatever, but it's important that you understand because I'm just going to be dealing with the mark today. And so now let's go to find the mark. Now that we've laid that clear foundation, you, you now have set that scene. Here we go. The mark must be a sign of the church's authority, yes? And so you have to ask the beast himself, what is their mark of authority? And so here is an abridgment of the Christian doctrine. This is page 58. This is the Roman Catholic Church writings. There's a question and answer period here. And you see, you can come before you for yourself. This is for you. Please, how prove you that the church has power to command feast and holy days? Their answer, by the very act of changing the Sabbath into Sunday, which Protestants allow of and therefore fondly contradict themselves by keeping Sunday strictly and breaking most other feasts commanded by the same church. Question. Same. This is their writings. This is, this is not me. This is, you, go, you can go reference it for yourself. Have you any other way of providing or proving, sorry, that the church has power to institute festivals of precept? Answer. Had she not had such power, she could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. None whatsoever, they say. It doesn't come from scripture. Can't find it. As a matter of fact, anybody can find it. There's something God changed day from Saturday to Sunday. We should worship, worship and keep Sunday, Sunday holy. I'll give you a million dollars right now. I'll go broke if you can prove it to me is not there. And they knew it. That's why they're saying what they're saying. And so here we go. This is Cardinal, Chancellor of Cardinal Gibbons. <laughs> this is what he says. Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. And the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical authority in religious things. Yes, family. Sunday. Let me say this. No one has the mark of the beast right now. The mark of the beast becomes the one's mark of the beast when it is enforced by law. It is enforced by law. But what I'm telling you, we're getting there. You're going to see COVID-19 crisis is paving the way for this very thing to happen. We are, we are here. Sunday, a word from a Roman Catholic priest. This is what it says, it is vowed to remind the Presbyterians, the Baptists, the Methodists, and all other Christians that the Bible does not support them anywhere in their observance of Sunday. Sunday is an institution of the Roman Catholic Church. And those who observe the day observe a commandment of the Catholic Church. 
is from the Catholic Church. And so I know when P I, I've been doing these meetings for years and, and people have come when they're realizing this truth and they're searching for themselves, they're like, wow, all these times because of tradition, because it comes from tradition, they follow the Lamb because they love Jesus. They say, I want to follow the Lamb wherever they go. And so they no longer keep Sunday holy and they move into God's seventh day Sabbath. Because Sunday, the reality is Sunday has been based on custom, tradition, and the command of the Roman church. Yes, family. And it's amazing. Even in Daniel 7, we haven't dealt with Daniel too much, but Daniel predicted that the beast would have power to think to change times and laws. That's Daniel 7, 25. That's what it says in Daniel, the prophecies of Daniel that, that reveal who the Roman Catholic Church is and how they changed it and when they changed it. And this is what's happened because this has been years. God is going to reveal all truth and things to come. Very interesting. Lucius Ferraris, it's from the Papa, this is the Catholic writings. It says, the Bishop of Rome is of so great authority and power that he can modify, explain, or interpret even divine laws. The Bishop of Rome can modify divine law. Since his power is not of man, but of God, and he acts as the representative of God upon earth. That's, that's their own writings. That's, Look at Peter Gerwin. This is what he says. This is from the Converts Catechism of Doctrine. This is from the Catholic Church Catechism. Here you go. This is what they say. Which is the Sabbath day? They say, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? We answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Wow. They, they, they let you know it, it's no, you know, this is no thing to you. They, they, they tell you where it came from. Priest Thomas Enright, president of Redemptionist College at one time. This is what he says. He says, prove to me from the Bible alone that I am bound to keep Sunday up. He says, there is no such law in the Bible. It is a law of the church alone. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The church says no. Wow. He says, by my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the commandment of the Roman church. That's where it comes from. D, Dr. E.T. Hiscox, this is what it says, the author of the Baptist Manual. He says, but what a pity that it comes branded with the mark of paganism and Christian with the name of the sun god, then adopted and sanctified by the papal apostasy and bequeathed as a sacred legacy to Protestantism. Yeah, they, go back, they go back to history and they see where it comes from. It comes from paganism, worshiping the sun. That's where you get the Sunday. They worship the sun. And so the Roman Catholic Church, they changed the system because paganism and Christianity came together. And then they said, in order to get everybody to worship, let's do this Sunday. And that's where you have this institution. And so this is why you can clearly see that it'll be no problem for atheists or people who don't believe in God to take this Sunday or not. Because, you know, it's Sunday, it's Sunday. As a, hey, it's nothing new. Sunday is a counterfeit Sabbath. And Satan receives homage through Sunday worship because he is the one who instituted it. Ezekiel 18 talks about, you know, check Ezekiel 8, 16 in the Bible. God shares a scene when he sees his priest uh, worshiping the sun, turning towards the east, worshiping the sun. It's all there, family. It's very clear. It's got so much to share, but I can't do it now. And this is why we're going to see even reference to this enforcement. This is where labor unions are going to come in, family. So I can't say too much right now. St. Catherine, Catholic Church Sentinel. This is them. May 21st, 1995, people who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. That's what it is. This is, this is what I'm saying. If, if you talk about scripture, if Bible and Bible alone Protestant, something's happened to the Protestant Reformation. There's only one group protesting. And you, because that one group protesting, gets what's happening? This is why this scripture is important. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was raw with the woman, the church, but he went to make war with this small group of individuals he called the remnant of our seed and identifies them who keep the commandments of God, all 10, the fourth commandment, yes, the seventh day Sabbath, but that means you must keep the other six too and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. What's the testimony of Jesus Christ? The spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy. He will guide you all truth, all truth, and tell you things to come. I told you, I tell you all the time, it's like playing a game, game of Udo, and I know what card's coming next. You get angry. You get what? You don't want me in the, in the game because I know what moves coming next. We know what's happening next. That's why, because the word of God is letting us know. So, family, 
And so John predicted that Satan would try to force everyone to receive the mark of the beast. There are sincere Christians honoring Sunday or not keeping the Sabbath. You don't even know. But God will call everyone on earth to know and make a decision at this time. And the time is here. But is the issue Sunday Christian versus Sabbath Christian? I think when you watch the message, that's why I want to go to the message. I'm encouraging you to watch it so you have a better understanding of the importance of the Sabbath and, and the mentality of the Sabbath and why the Sabbath. And your eyes should be open to the truth. Because the reality is we have, we have Sunday Christians worshiping God on the wrong day, but really for the right reason. But we also have Saturday Christians worshiping God on the right day, but for the wrong reason. And God's calling both groups out of that. Message is a righteous by faith message. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you tree free. Oh, there's so much joy will fill your heart when we understand the good news of Jesus Christ. And the, the Sabbath Saturday issue is going to be two individuals, it's going to be two sides those who love and obey God, and those who will obey man or the man of sin. And so, and so that's why you have the scene. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their forehead on their right hand or their foreheads. It says, remember, these are signs, the symbols, the forehead. The forehead is your belief system, your belief, your thoughts, the decision-making takes place in your mind. They, these are made up in the mind. They will, they will serve allegiance, choosing to believe Sunday as holy, contrary to God's word. But then the right hand, when you look at the right hand, this represents your works, your actions. These don't want to, want to, but they do so for fear of persecution. So they receive the mark. People will be marked by working on God's Sabbath day and keeping Sunday laws for convenience, or because of the income, or because of they're, they're only persecuted, or even their family. And so when you think about it in your forehead, for example, you know, your decision making, some, some of you during this COVID-19 time, you, you're wearing masks because you don't want to catch the virus. You truly believe that by wearing a mask, you, you're not going to catch the virus. And so, and so that's your decision making in your forehead. And, that, and you truly believe it. And, that, and you receive, you know, that, that's, you, that's your decision making. That's fine. I'm just drawing parallel here. But, but for, for your hand, some of you don't, don't believe it's that serious. But, but you wear a mark because you have to. I got to eat. And, and they tell me, unless I have a mask, I'm not coming into this building as a law. I don't believe it, but, but I did it because I need food. We got to eat. And they let me come in because I have a mask. It's not a more issue. It says fine. But, but in my mind, I, you know, you, you say you don't really believe it. But many, you see family, many will take the mark though they don't believe it. But for convenience, they will obey man instead of God. This is why. This is why you must have the spirit of God because the time they're about to enter into in human flesh, you know, it's going to be very difficult. That's why I need God's spirit in order to stand. I need God. I need Jesus in me. That's the only way I'm going to stand. There's a war going on. And so, family, as I transition into now the practical part of what's going on, you may say, here we go. That no man may buy, sell, except one who has the mark of the beast, the number of his name. You can only apply this to today because the technology to do this is coming into existence. We'll talk about that more next week. So much going on, family. So much going on. And the reality is something strange is happening in 2018. We'll talk about Kanye West the week after next. There's going to be a religious revival, a false revival, by the way, before God's true revival. <laughs> You've heard a song closed on Sunday. You're my Chick-fil-A. Yeah, we're going to talk about it. We're going to see what's going on. Because see, something's happening. All these celebrities are now becoming Catholic, Christian. Something's happening. But before the real revival, there's going to be a false revival. And I'm telling you, hey, if Trump gets back in, it looks like he will. Damn it. The time is at hand. It could be Trump and two news. I don't, I don't know, but it looks like Revelation 13 will come into existence and Christians get got Trump into the office. And remember, the issue is going to be the Christians are going to push back against this other power, which is atheism. So you begin to see something happen. I'm going to show you. Don't leave this message because I'm going to show you something at the end that's going to blow your mind so you understand where we are. But here we go. It continues. 
Vatican announces Laudato Si anniversary. Some of you don't know what a Laudato Si is. This is the Catholic, the Pope's encyclical. They come, this came out in 2015. But look what it says. This is why we understand what's going on. This is what it says, Vatican City. This is their own news newspaper. We're here in contemporary now. The Vatican announced that it will commemorate the fifth anniversary of Pope Francis encyclical on the environment with a year-long series of initiatives dedicated to the safeguarding and care for the earth. Climate change is the one that kind of starts, got it all, you know, sparking, sparking, go, go. But it says, in a statement released by the Vatican Press Office, May 16th, this last week's Sabbath, the Diocesary for Promoting Integral Human Development announced a special Laudato Si anniversary year from May 24th, that's tomorrow, 2020, to May 24th, 2021, which will emphasize the ecological conversion in action. So you may not know exactly what that means. You'll begin, you'll begin to evolve uh, after I show you some of these things. It continues. It says, as the world continues to deal with the coronavirus pandemic, the disastery said the encyclical's message is just as prophetic today as it was in 2015. I'm going to show you something, what it says in the encyclical. Because it's talking about, in this second it's talking about, you know, he's pretty much got the plan for this new world, this new world. And they talk about all has a crisis took place, if a crisis took place, we're moving to a new world. And so he says, truly COVID-19 has made clear how deeply we are all interconnected and interdependent. As we begin to envision a post-COVID world, we need above all an integral approach as everything is closely interrelated and today's problems call for a vision capable of taking into account every aspect of the global crisis. The statement said, among the events set to take place throughout the year are prayer service and webinars dedicated to environmental care, education, and the economy. The disaster also detailed the rollout of a seven-year journey, a seven-year journey a seven-year journey toward integral ecology for families, dioceses, schools, universities, hospitals, businessmen, farms, and religious orders. Seven years. These things come fast. Seven years. This is very interesting. I had a presentation by Walter Vaith a couple of weeks ago. I talked about something in seven years. 2020, between 2020 and 2027. I don't know, I'm not putting any dates and times to anything, from, but these things seem very interesting. These, these things were happening before. It seems things are happening very much, very, very, very quickly. And so this is what encyclical says. This wasn't his encyclical. In his encyclical, in 237, this is what he says. He says, on Sunday, our participation in the Eucharist has special importance. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, Jewish Sabbath, Sunday is not, is not a Jewish Sabbath. It's man's, God made the Sabbath for man is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves and with others and with the world. He says, Sunday is the day of resurrection. Really? The first day of the new creation, whose first fruits and the Lord's risen humanity, the pledge of the final transfiguration of all created reality. It also proclaims man's eternal rest in God. No, it doesn't. The Bible is very clear. What commends God's eternal rest is the seventh day Sabbath. What, what are you talking about, Mr. Pope? He continues, and he comes on, he says, the law of weekly rest forbade work on the seventh day so that your ox and your donkey may have rest and the son of your maidservant and the stranger may be refreshed. He says, rest opens, your, uh, rest opens your eyes to the larger picture and gives us renewed sensitivity to the rights of others. And so the day of rest centered on the Eucharist sheds its light on the whole week and motivates us to greater concern for nature and the poor. Nature, ecology has something to do with Sunday? was in Laudato Si. And this is when he came to the United States for the first time a Pope spoke to Congress where legislation takes place. Let's talk about that last week. They accepted it. So I'm going to show you. Here we go. I'm going to show you. This video I'm about to show you was five years ago. Family, all the world is wondering after the beast. Pope Francis has released his encyclical calling all people to be good stewards of the earth. As a call to action in the lead up to the UN Climate Summit in Paris in December. The very fact that arguably the most important religious figure is addressing this issue highlights how enormously significant and important it is for all of humanity. God gave it to us as a garden. 
we cannot be quitted as a wilderness. I commend His Holiness and all faith and scientific leaders here today for raising awareness of the urgent need to promote sustainable development and climate change. The Pope makes it clear he's not a scientist, but at the very same time he tells us all, listen to what scientists are telling us. Science and religion are coming together. The more we understand about the world, the more amazing we realize it is. We can certainly unite to preserve this remarkable planet. I think it's a tremendously rich times where we can see the interface of science and spirituality. And this for me is really hopeful. The encyclical concludes with a multi-religious prayer. Every religious tradition has its own religious and spiritual resources to help us protect our common home. Islam We are not the owners of the earth. We are stewards, have inherited the earth, and we have to keep it to handle it over to the next generations. In the weeks and months leading up to Paris, the religious leaders of all the traditions are going to be calling us to stand up, to take action, to make this historic change that lies before us. This climate change issue has to be talked about in every church, every temple, every synagogue, and every mosque. It's not one organization, it was not one unit, not one person. It's going to be combined effort from public, private, different industries that are actually going to solve this problem. Pope Francis is imploring us to care for the earth in new kinds of ways. And I believe that as all of our interreligious leaders come together, the world will respond accordingly. With the encyclical, Pope Francis has issued an urgent call to take action to protect the planet. The time to act is now. Time to act is now. And for the last five years, they've been bringing Israel uh, Thornburg came in. But, but here you go, family, because it all talks about, you know, it's all reference to climate change and what's happening to the world. This is May 12th. It says, UN chief appeals, this is this year, 10 days ago, a couple of days ago, UN chief appeals to common humanity across all faiths in tackling the coronavirus. Our shared vulnerability to the coronavirus pandemic reveals our common humanity. The UN chief said on Tuesday during an online meeting with religious leaders on the important role they can play in limiting the damage caused by COVID-19. Remember, the issue is going to be a worship issue. But who's going to be over this, this, this new order? Who has the most influence? And who has that Laudato C and that encyclical that gives you the plan of what to do? Someone's going to be pointing to the Roman Catholic Church. This, this is even here in Bermuda, family. You saw yeah, in TNN News last week, uh, it talked about global, global faith leaders to join forces on May 14th in prayer and create the Bermuda Committee for Human uh, uh, Fraternity. And, and so, you know, it talked about something happened last year in December 2017 at, at Government House, and they signed a document and they're now being joined together. And so who's now joined? I think it was the Catholic Church, then the, the Muslim Church, but now Reverend uh, Nick Deal, the Anglican Bishop, he signed this together. So together they agreed to coordinate their social justice obligations in the spirit of urgency that is required under the challenging circumstances created by the COVID-19 pandemic. So something's happening. They're bringing all the religions together to prophesy. That's why he has so much to say. So CNN, Pope says coronavirus could be a response from nature to climate change. So the answer is in the encyclical. Something's happening, it's very clear. And sick because the Bible lets us know that all the world follows after the beast. The stage is set. Guess who will turn to? The United States will make it happen. Who miss next week? We are really here, family. 
the agitation, the Sunday agitation has started and the final movements, the rapid ones. This is what came to my attention last night. Last night, I already finished my message, go to go sleep. And this thing popped up to me and here it goes. Here we go. Green cell, this is there, this is on the website. You can see the website there. Is there nothing you can do about the environment? That's right, nothing may be one of the best things you can do, nothing. One day every week to do nothing. This is the Green Sabbath Project. This is what it says. Green Sabbath aims to celebrate and foster local community. Events should bring neighbors together. Ideally, events should not require driving energy output or use of new material. And so what is happening is this is what, on June 4th, 2020, and this, this website has been going for a long time, for some time now, on June 4th, 2020, they will have a universal day of rest online discussion. They are gonna have a discussion on a universal day of rest, a and they're calling it a green Sabbath. I wonder what day is it going to be? And so here you have, you have the Zoom, you get the information, you go on the website, I signed up, they sent me an email, I will be on that Zoom discussion on June 4th at five o'clock for me to talk. Because family, listen to what it says. I'm telling you something, doing, and the movements are happening fast. It says, yet, the still spreading suffering, this, is, this, is, this just came out, the spreading suffering and the shutdowns imposed as a desperate survival strategy have also given many a glimpse of another way of life. For those privileged enough with job security or a sufficient savings, downtime with family, time for self-care have been unexpected gifts. People have started gardens, talking about what's happened during this lockdown, brought chickens and bees in numerous new stories and opinion pieces. People report on seeing through these things and they, that they previously assumed were natural and necessary. Self-sacrifice on the altar of work, costly and endless preening, FOMO, fear of missing out. Worship of celebrities, paying others to do things for us of, instead of doing them for ourselves. Infinite forms of distraction, escape and vanity. He says, with these lessons in mind, we must ask ourselves as a society some existentially uh, urgent questions. What do we want to take with us after the lockdowns have been lifted? In the face of a microscopic virus capable of humbling global human hubris, what have we experienced that is beneficial and necessary to keep in place? And what kind of world do we wish to step into as we leave quarantine? So yes, nineteen COVID-19 is setting the stage, family, for Revelation 13. He said, get the whole world on board. Some of us, we're, we're appreci we appreciated extra family time and we got things done around the house. And they're saying, listen, what about if now we have a one day a week resting 52 days a year. This is this what they're calling for. This is what it says. It says, before coronavirus, normal was anything but. It was craziness. We were making ourselves sick, killing ourselves in pursuit of illusory needs. It says, since our problem intertwined and, and one with another, and, and then he goes on and talks about this holistic solutions are needed. A universal day of rest, a weekly eco-sabbath, an ancient spiritual technology, Re re repurposed for collective ecological survival, you saw that already, suggests itself as one powerful tool. Sabbath, properly practiced, offers a weekly interruption of the suicidal and econometric fantasy of infinite growth. A weekly divestment from fossil fuels, a weekly investment in local community, a weekly bit of rewilding, a respite for both humans and other than humans, and, and a ritualized form for meditating on how we want to live. They say, as Greta Thornburg reminds us, we already know what the solutions are for our environmental crisis. Green Sabbaths will provide a recurring greenhouse for incubating the required collective consciousness and willpower the ultimate renewable energies to make the solutions reality. It says green Sabbaths will constitute both a model and a foretaste of the ecological same world to come. It says what are the benefits and challenges of such an idea and practice? What might such a day look like? Would it unite or divide? What steps, they wanna take steps, can we take now to make it happen? Please join the Green Sabbath Project for public discussion with environmental and religious leaders. The ones leading these is the environmental and religious leaders. Which day do you think they will choose? 
<laughs> I will be in that meeting. But family, as I conclude, the reality is, yeah, don't leave yet, because I have one video to show you, this image of the beast. Family, this is our message for next week. This is our message next week, because in order for these to happen, it has to be a legislation. Church and state have to come together. And you saw what the Bible says in reference to the image of the beast being formed. In order to make an image or likeness of something, we have to copy it. In other words, for the United States government to copy the aims and policies of papal Rome, it would have to tear down the wall of separation between church and state. Religious power would have to so control the government that she would make and enforce religious laws. For the Bible says, it causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound is healed. Yesterday, look what President Trump does. So, President of the United States, President Trump with the White House Task Force there as well. Thank you very much. At my direction, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is issuing guidance for communities of faith. I want to thank Dr. Redfield and the CDC for their work on this matter and all the other work they've been doing over the past what now seems like a long period of time. Today, I'm identifying houses of worship, churches, synagogue, and mosques as essential places that provide essential services. Some governors have deemed liquor stores and abortion clinics as essential, but have left out churches and other houses of worship. It's not right. So I'm correcting this injustice and calling houses of worship essential. I call upon governors to allow our churches and places of worship to open right now. If there's any question, they're going to have to call me, but they're not going to be successful in that call. These are places that hold our society together and keep our people united. The people are demanding to go to church and synagogue, go to their mosque. Many millions of Americans embrace worship as an essential part of life. The ministers, pastors, rabbis, imams, and other faith leaders will make sure that their congregations are safe as they gather and pray. I know them well. They love their congregations. They love their people. They don't want anything bad to happen to them or to anybody else. The governors need to do the right thing and allow these very important essential places of faith to open right now for this weekend. If they don't do it, I will override the governors. In America, we need more prayer, not less. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, everyone. It's a pleasure to join you today. That was a great announcement from President. Mercy. The second beast of revelation has spoken. Family, that's a bully move. That's a bully move. He says, I will open those churches. Something's happening. The image of the beast is being formed. That was huge, family. We'll wait to see what happens next. But I praise God. We are living in a very important time. Because remember, it is Christians that give power. Right now, the king of the north and the king of the fight are fighting. But we know that it is not atheism that wins, but it's Christianity, so-called Christianity, that is what going to institute the mark of the beast. And that's why, as I see how things are unrolling. Mr. Trump knows something. Mr. Trump is doing something. And family, the final movements are rapid ones. Things are happening so much I wanted to share, I could not, but, but you saw what he did just now. He will override every single governor. Family, there's this a constitutional crisis going on right now in the United States of America. Some, something is happening. Something's happening, family. We are here. The final movements are rapid ones. But I, I praise God that, that through the struggle, because the reality is there's going to be a group caught in the middle, just like Jesus was caught in the middle between the, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. 
is going to be grouped that they will follow the lamb wherever he goes and, and the world will come against them. But the Bible reminds me, don't miss next week, in Revelation 17, 12 to 14, the 10 horns which you saw are 10 kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beasts. These are of one mind and they will give their power and authority to the beast. They will make war with the lamb, but praise God, family, and the lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Now is the time to be called chosen and faithful. Now is the time to make sure that you have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Because family, soon and very soon, we are going home. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Family, we are not born of this world. Everyone who's born of this world will overcome this world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, and that, that will be our faith. We are living in the very time of Revelation 13, and is revealing that the setup of that is because of COVID-19. I praise God that God is showing his people what time it is, but also what they need to do. And what we need to do during this time is to make sure that we are called and chosen. This is, this is making our calling and election true. Asking Christ, I believe, but, but I'm asking you, Christ, every day. I need you to dwell in me. Well, we're not ready for this crisis by ourselves in our flesh. We are in desperate need of the Holy Spirit in order to stand. Family, it's, it's gonna, we're entering into some challenging times. But wouldn't you want God, if you knew the fire was coming, wouldn't you want someone to prepare you so you're not caught in the fire? And God is letting you know right now, the time is at hand. Revelation 13 and COVID-19. Next week's Sabbath, we continue with the image of the beast, and you'll see clearly even more and more as the scene is being set. But I just want to encourage you to continue to make your calling and election sure. If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have an opportunity to do so today. If, if you haven't accepted his truth of his seventh day Sabbath, he's called you and convicted you, here is your opportunity to do that today. You can make contact with me. You can private chat me. You can call me on the phone if you want to make a decision and enter into God's full truth. You need more Bible studies, more understanding. We're here to help you because we love you. Because God says you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. May God's truth rest upon your heart, family, as we prepare for the time at hand. Father God, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for the love that you've given us Lord God, through your word. Thank you for giving us this opportunity, oh God, to know what time it is so that we can begin to know exactly what to do, to begin to share, Lord God, and warn our family members and get our households right, our families, Lord God, even during this time. Now time playing, time for playing games is over. God, and so we're asking that you would, that you, you would reveal continuously your love and, and that we will have your passion, oh God, through the indwelling power of your Holy Spirit. Let us continuously, day by day, be surrendered so that we will not even be fooled and deceived by the wiles of the enemy. Let us, O oh God, even today, continuously put on the full armor of God so that we can stand in that evil day. Thank you for preparing us. Thank you for saving us. In Jesus' name, let the church of God say, amen, 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 amen.